Hello everyone, welcome to Friends of the ICPBC. Um, with my International College for Professional BitFit Consultants, my plan was to travel the world and meet people all over the world and teach them about bit fittings. Um, that plan has changed a little bit, but I still met a lot of nice people that have the same mission as the ICPBC, which is of course improving horse welfare. So um, I'm doing a little interview webinar with Christina Wilkins and she's from the magazine Horse and People. And I wrote a few articles in that uh, magazine, but I also got copies of course to the Netherlands. And I really like that the articles are really about uh, all about horse welfare and yeah, well, just different from what I know from uh, a magazine. So I thought it was a good idea to ask uh, Christine for this interview and see how she got into this business. So um, hi, Christine. <laughs> Could you tell me uh, a little bit about your journey uh, getting to be founder of a magazine? How are you, Natasha? It's really, really nice to be with you and to have met you earlier this year. I was, I was so chuffed when you contacted me because I had been thinking about how uh, to get fit fitting information through to our readers through the magazine. So it was perfect timing and uh, really, well, actually it was overdue. I think we need, we really need this information to go out to everybody in the horse world, how to make the horses more comfortable when they're wearing a bit. So thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about the magazine. We've been going for a very long time. The, the magazine itself is probably about 30 years old, but I took it over 12 years ago. Okay. So. I began working for the magazine uh, in 2004, and then I purchased the magazine in 2009. And I've been the uh, editor of the magazine since then. Okay, great. And um, well, what did you do before? Did you always, ha you must have something with horses. Do you, did you own horses or were you working in any other uh, yeah, area with horses, or has editing be the the main uh, reason to start this magazine? So my background in with horses is eventing and coaching. Mm -hmm. So I trained um, as a coach, and I was I actually grew up in a riding school. So my mother started a riding school, and. I have to say that I'm originally Spanish, okay. so I am, yeah. I I'm, I'm an immigrant to Australia. I have been in Australia 22 years, but uh, before that, of course, I was born in Madrid, in Spain, and I was the youngest of uh, three children. And my mother had grown up in, in England, even though she is Spanish. She grew up in England and she was exposed to pony club and horses in England. Mm -hmm. And so when we were young, she wanted us to experience horse riding and she wanted to do some horse riding herself. Uh, but the scene in, in Spain was very different for beginners. There was, uh, it's like riding clubs, it's very controlled and there weren't many horses or horses or ponies, actually small horses and ponies for children to learn to ride on. And well, it's a very long story, but eventually my mother started bringing in ponies from overseas that were well trained. Mm -hmm. And we started uh, a pony club in which was really like a riding club, but using ponies. And I grew up in that environment. So it was an incredible childhood. I was, it was more, more through my teenage years and I had lots of horses around me, really progressive instructors that were prepared to do something different as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of emphasis on welfare. My mother really instilled uh, emphasis on welfare and on, on how to keep, make the horses happier. So I had that background, which was really interesting. 
Then I moved on with my own horses and my competitive career. I did a lot of eventing and I was extremely lucky to be at the right place at the right time. And I had a horse that was good enough to compete internationally. And it was just before the Barcelona Olympics. It was the three years before the Barcelona Olympics. And I managed to get on the training squad that was financed to go over to the UK to uh, try to make, to put a team together for the Barcelona Olympics. Wow. And did you get on the Olympics as well or not? I did not know this. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't make the team. I did oh. qualify for the, for the Olympics, but I had a lot of, well, it's really difficult to, to make it to the Olympics. And with one horse only, it yeah. was, I, I couldn't keep, keep the horse sound enough. I tried other horses, but I never, but it wasn't, it was all too rushed. And uh, one thing that I did learn is that I didn't really want to be a professional competitor. So I really enjoyed coaching and I learned a lot being in the UK for three years and being on the competition scene. So I had a lot of, I had some of the access to some of the best um, international coaches that, uh, or of course, eventing, uh, the eventing hub was the UK at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was an incredible opportunity. And then I focused, after that, I focused more on coaching. And what did you, what made you decide that uh, coaching was more your thing than, than training on professional level? I think, well, it's difficult to know at the time I wasn't, I was, wasn't really enjoying the pressure. And I, I was starting to the, I was starting to think more along, well, maybe what it was is that I had that welfare background and I just thought that there was, there was better things to do or better ways that we could be doing things and in getting the horses to the Olympic levels. And also I thought that teaching young people to ride and teaching adults that really want to ride, I found that very rewarding. So that was, that was those were the two things, probably, the pressure that you, you're under at the top competition levels, a lot of the times you're doing things that you, in hindsight, you wouldn't do. You know, you're pushing horses a lot, you're pushing yourself a lot, you're, because you have to be at that event at that time and there's no, there's no leeway, there's no, uh, you know. Yeah. So those, those sort of things were, made it less fun to be around horses or to be involved with horses. Whereas coaching, I found more rewarding. So that was my, that was my thing, yeah. Yeah, I do recognize that, that when you uh, training for competition and also when you look around, the more you know uh, and the more you see happening in horses and how to use their muscles and the more you, you get known with the biomechanics, the harder it becomes to even get at that high level because you sometimes see horses at that high level and you think, well, I have them in pension there uh, because, because, yeah, you see all the difficulties they have with their body and you don't want to ask that of your horse. So I can imagine, yeah, that's also a part of your decision, especially when you have a welfare background which I'm really jealous on because I have no family at all in horses. I'm the only one that likes horses. So uh, I started really late with riding, but yeah, that's uh, pretty cool. So when did you, um, you started the magazine uh, in 2009, you said? Yes. Yeah, so I moved to Australia via New Zealand and actually I lived in New Zealand for five years and that was, I think, I consider it the break I needed and it really brought me back to what it is like to really enjoy horses. So in New Zealand, there is, it, there's a, an enormous tradition in horsemanship. There are some amazing horse people 
and some mm -hmm. amazing horses. And it, it's a lot more relaxed and it's a lot more about enjoying the horses and using the horses for, for things like mustering. And, and I did a little bit of hunting there as well, which is really, they don't hunt foxes, they hunt hares. And we, I, as far as I can tell, we never really found anything, but we enjoyed <laughs> jumping and cantering and, and just the social scene. And it brought the fun back to two horses that I had lost a little bit. And then when I had the opportunity to move to Australia, I thought it was, I just felt it was the right thing to do. Okay. Then in, in 2004, something happened that really changed my life. And it is that I, one of the jobs that I had as a, as for an extra income was translating horse books yeah. from English into <laughs> Spanish. And so I had translated quite a few horse books. And um, in 2004, I was sent a book that changed my life. And it was, it's a book called The Truth About Horses by okay. Dr. Andrew McLean. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I and, haven't read uh, the book, but of course I do know him. <laughs> well, it, ha having the opportunity to translate the book was amazing because everything that I knew about horses was, it was like a whole, like all the puzzle pieces just were put in place in this book. I could understand how things happen, how things go wrong, how training works. Nobody had explained it in that way, even though I had got to Olympic level, almost, yeah. I didn't know, I, nobody had explained how a horse learns to do the incredible things they learn to do. <laughs> and it just made so much sense. And the fact that I, when I, was, when I had the opportunity to, to translate this book, I was actually in Australia and of course, Andrew McLean is Australian, very long way away from me, from me. He lives in Melbourne. I live in near Brisbane. I couldn't believe it. So of course, I got in touch with him, and uh, and I consulted with him a few times over the translation. He was really pleased that the book was being translated into Spanish, and then. I had the opportunity to get involved in equitation science, which was just at the cups, cusp of emerging. So the International Society for Equitation Science was founded in 2005. So it was just perfect timing. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, I always say yeah. when you want something or you have to go somewhere, you meet the right people and ride horses at the right time. I don't know why, but that's what's always happening. That's right. So that was my first thing. And at the same time, I, I got an opportunity to work for Horses and People magazine. So I was doing just a minor role part time because the lady that that owned the magazine at the time lived nearby and, and had met me. And so I started working. I started working with with her. And then the opportunity ar arose in 2009 to buy the magazine which was then what I did. And uh, I had the magazine with, in partnership with a friend, Maxine Ellison, for mm -hmm. almost 10 years. And then Maxine retired in, two years ago, exactly. And I took over the, the, the whole magazine by myself. And did you make any changes or, or has it always been really welfare related from the start? So the magazine was started off very, very small and it was very different. It was very much for advertising and it was a local magazine. So only in this area of Southeast Queensland, it was free as well. So you could pick it up at the saddleries and produce stores. And it had a lot of information about current events about services that were available 
and the, that sort of information. So when I took over as editor, I, I began to change the magazine to the information that I really enjoy learning about. So I started to, to bring in a lot more veterinary um, information into the magazine. But then of course I had the opportunity to start promoting equitation science, which sounds, equitation science sounds like a, a very fancy thing, but basically what equitation science is about is just explaining how it works. Yeah. So explaining how horses work, explaining how they learn, explaining why they do the things they do and why they don't do the things they don't do. So we try, yeah. It, and of course, because it's a science, it just has to go through a process of making sure that they are saying the right thing in the right way and they're not just making that. So that's, it's given me the opportunity to really focus on that, con that type of content. And so the magazine became an evidence-based magazine with a big focus on welfare, which is the mission of the International Society for Equitation Science as well, is in facilitating the research into that, into how humans and horses interact, what happens during those interactions, and what can we measure to know that it is actually what it what is happening. Yeah, yeah, it's also a great network, and they have, uh, uh, yeah, meetings and, and a lot to share as well. And to be honest, there is not much um, studies, there is not much scientifically investigated yet about uh, Bitfit consulting, except very basic things like uh, wounds in the mouth or, but of course it's a whole process, a, a bit, yeah, involves so many structures. And what the good thing is, and you probably recognize that when you're working with a lot of people, you, you, yeah, well, you meet again the right people anyway, but now I'm already talking to people and I think a few must know equitation science because they're into the studies and I've recently, oh, and I can't remember her name, but I recently met someone that's doing a study about bits and she was not known with the profession of bitfit consulting and so i explained on all the well in short what i was doing and that gave her a lot of new ideas for new studies so hopefully in the future um, this profession will also get more evidence based but it's good that there is evidence for what we do so it's not just talking um, but really showing that that's the way uh, horses learn or that's the way horses are built. And I do uh, myself use a lot of um, studies from done on humans because the GMJ is really important when it comes to bit fitting. Uh, you can imagine a bit in your mouth will affect uh, yeah, your jaw joint. And so my evidence and, and translating is from uh, studies done on humans and transferring to well, one of my own horses who actually has a piece of bone stuck uh, within his TMJ. So it's definitely a case of uh, TMJ disorders. And I must say, yeah, it does cross-link. Do you call that cross-linking or at least, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's really interesting. That's what I find really interesting. And that's what I think probably the next step is to really maximize collaboration between different disciplines. So for, for a while, because equitation scientists are actually all sorts of different people. So you have vet, veter, some are veterinarians, some come from the field of ethology, which is the study of animal behavior. Yeah. There are psychologists, there are anthropologists, there are uh, there's room for, there are anatomists, there are statisticians, there's such a huge range. And of course now as well, in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen a, an explosion of the courses that are being made available to students at, at university and college 
that are equine focused and that all the, the range of different modalities and fields that they can specialize in or that they can study during their course. So I think that happened and equitation scientists got really excited about their work and they started saying look what we what, what we found out look we you know this is how it works and you know we found this and we found that and of course because it, it's such a young science they had to start from zero so a lot of the studies a lot of the criticisms you get sometimes from horse people is well duh of course horses do that yes yeah what a waste of time to 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 study that yes and but of course you have to do these because it's a building block you can't just start studying something here because then if it goes wrong you don't know if you if it's because you missed some steps that you thought you assumed were true and actually they're not yes so yeah. so that's where so equitation scientists were so excited and they just including myself who i was promoting them and we went wow this is fantastic this is what and then what happened because the horse world is very anchored in traditions and there's hierarchies in the horse industry where some people know and some people don't know and there's all these people in between and you have that transfer of knowledge and they just went we don't want to know <laughs> <laughs> and we you know we know what we know and that's enough and we know you know it works for us and don't come telling us that something that we're doing is wrong or you know they got very defensive and protective and so the, the horse industry kind of closed in a little bit it's in sectors not not everywhere and slowly but surely i mean we're we we're australian based horses and people magazine is based in australia but i really feel we were the, we were definitely the first magazine to positively embrace and positively promote equitation science with a constructive sense so we so my role was as an editor was to choose the topics that i felt were most applicable to the everyday horse owner and that could actually help so i wasn't i've never really been interested or i've never i never felt that it was our place to just criticize but actually bring constructive information into the into the yeah. horse so world. you're trying to close the gap between yeah trying to close yeah. the gap and give people say yes we do have a problem here this is a problem but here are some ideas as to how we could do better yeah yeah so that is one of the key aspects of the magazine and i think that's probably the the, the aspect that sets us apart because some magazines that are more into welfare are more into just pointing out all the problems and there are problems all over the world in 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 every industry in every society at every level so that's very depressing as far as i'm concerned it's <laughs> yes it yeah. there is a place for it we do need to be shaken up but my uh, my contribution was okay we have a problem what can we do about it and then there's other there's other publications and there's other media that just want to tell you that everything's great and that there's no problem we're doing fantastic and uh, and life is rosy so i'm trying to i'm trying to walk it's a little bit of a, like walking a tightrope and trying mm -hmm. to yes admit mistakes that we make and see if there's a way to make it better which is why i'm so interested in bit fitting because we have been putting bits in horses mouths for thousands of years and have we ever asked the horse what it feels like or whether there would be a better uh, solution whether we can make them more comfortable most of the time we just as long as we get what we want out of the horse that's good enough yeah I think we need to ask the horse. 
how how he feels about it yeah and yeah that's true and what i found really interesting because i think people are evolving quite quickly uh, at least that's what i noticed uh, when I do a bit fitting consult, I also look at how they ride and other aspects that can, of course, interfere with uh, the connection. And I always try to focus, even it's, if it's a rider fault, I'm not saying, oh, you're doing it wrong. I'm telling like, okay, this is how the body works. And I explain, uh, you're now rotating the cervical spine instead of uh, lateral flexion or doing uh, bending say uh, normal bending and I explain what I see and then people start thinking about it because not every horse can do what you ask and you have to look at the individual horse I have to look at the individual horse in his mouth but I also have to look at the individual horse's body because we can ask a certain uh, movement but the same if you want to let me do uh, some gymnastic exercise well I'll be really really bad of it so um, because it's not, not just not possible my my hamstrings are too short I will be hurt and I think now it's um, true bit fit consulting for me it's now giving opportunities to uh, make people more aware of body use and then I yeah I think in the Netherlands people are really interested in learning more and um, not just about bits but they start to think okay there is more going on but the thing is with a lot of courses and and a lot of things you see uh, on videos on tv they're always perfect no one shows you the road no one shows you and i'm going to do that and i'm already scared <laughs> but no one shows uh, themselves riding on a horse that's doing crazy stuff and has poor connections and really focus out okay this is what the rider is doing wrong this because that's um yeah also showing your vulnerable oh that's a difficult word vulnerability. vulnerability yeah vulnerability yes that's right we need to do more of that that's for sure because i think also with horse riding being such a competitive sport for, for a lot of people, not for everybody, of course, but certainly I grew up in a, in a competitive environment. And you, when you grow up in a competitive environment, you tend to think of failure as a bad thing rather than as a mistake to learn from. And I think that's something that we should all get better at. And uh, admitting oh, that so we don't, oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry about the noise. I don't know how to turn those off. So the, yes, going back to the, to being more vulnerable and being, and learning for, learning that mistakes are actually opportunities, not failures. They're, they're out of a, and when there's a crisis, that's an opportunity to do something different, something better. So I'm, I'm all for that. Although it, is, it isn't easy to, to go through that process. I'm sure you also found, I'm, I'm pretty sure because I've spoken to so many people about this, that it's like when I read The Truth About Horses, all of a sudden I went like, oh, wow, I don't know anything. Yeah, yeah. I thought I knew so much because I was doing well and I was training these horses. But then you, and then you start thinking, ah, yes, but it only worked with that horse and that horse and that horse. And look at all the horses that you, that I did try and they just fell on the, on the, along the wayside. And now we've got a word for that. It's called wastage. And it's awful to think about how many horses we produce that don't, that end up as wastage. And of course, when, when an equitation scientist comes along and says, and puts that label in front of you, you go like, whoa, you know, like, I don't want to know about this. This is ugly. I, that's just not. And, you know, we do have to confront these bad parts of the horse industry so that we can do better, we can, we can waste less horses, we can make more horses achieve their potential. Yeah, 
Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, what for me was really eye-opening because I always, uh, let's put an example that you say you ride from the hind towards the front and not from the front towards the back. Really, honestly, every phase of my horse riding career, I thought I was doing that. And every time later on, I figured out that I wasn't doing it correct. And every time when I look back, even when I look back now at two years ago in riding, I'm like, okay, this was not so good after all. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, that's, that's quite com confronting, but it's also um, makes you understand the people that aren't there yet. Because you also see sometimes people really judgmental on other ones. But, uh, same as with roll cure and other uh, trainings methods. I did ride uh, round, very round. Uh, I'm Dutch, I did that. And uh, I learned during the way. So, but no one will learn by saying, oh, you're doing it wrong. You're like, go away. <laughs> That's so yeah, it's, uh, it's a... Yeah. It's a process and I think it's really interesting and I think cooperation is really important, but uh, I'm really positive because I meet so many nice people and so much, yeah, looks like I'm meeting even more and more people thinking alike. And of course there are differences in between them and we all think, we all still think we're doing it right, but at least we know that in a couple of years we might look back and think, oh no, maybe she was even more right or but we're open for yeah. critics and, and yeah, we are more comfortable. Absolutely. And I think, I think it's a, it's trust, isn't it? It's trust. I trust you. We've built a relationship by having conversations and with, with information exchanges. And I trust you with, when you first, when you first meet someone, you, I have a, I have a special responsibility as the editor of a magazine to make judgments as to whether I trust that the information they are, they want to pub, they want me to publish in my magazine that goes out to thousands of people, whether that is good information and it's well-meaning and it's going to make a positive difference. So that doesn't happen. You don't just pluck trust and just go, oh yeah, you have to build it. And you can only build it through conversations. So yeah. that's what I'm, I'm really hoping that the next phase in, in the, in, for, for equestrianism is a lot more intercollaboration with, and a lot more goodwill to find agreement rather than to find disagreement. That's, yeah. what, I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. I think that's a nice uh, end to uh, this interview and I, I, I really want to thank you uh, for it because I don't have anything to say than agree. Um, <laughs> the magazine is also uh, available for Dutch people, huh? Yes, yeah, so the magazine is a print magazine. So we actually, we're, we're still printing a hard copy of the magazine, but we also have an app that works on mobile devices. So if okay. people, I understand, you know, I myself understand that printing is, is nice to have the magazine in your hands. I'm sure you enjoy receiving it in, in yeah. Holland. <laughs> much, much nicer. I mean, we're all, we're all looking at screens all the time, especially now with, with COVID. This year is everything's online and you, you just want to sit back and, and not look into a screen. But, for people that, that are comfortable reading and prefer to just read online, the, the magazine is available as a digital app. So the, the app works really well okay. and has lots of different features. And then also we have a website where we post and publish a lot of the content that we produce, not all of it. Some of it is exclusive to the magazine, but a lot of the content is published on the, on the website. So it's horsesandpeople.com.au. Yes, I will and also write it uh, somewhere below or, <laughs> yeah. That sounds great. And yes, we can, we do mail the magazine overseas and we have quite a few subscribers overseas that, of course it costs a little bit more on, in postage, but yeah. uh, it's, it's still feasible. And it's in English. And, <laughs> and it's in English, definitely, which, uh, yeah. yes. 
which uh, luckily for a lot of you Europeans, you are multilingual, which is amazing. Yes, mm -hmm. fantastic. But you're European yourself as well. <laughs> I really didn't know you, you had a Spanish background, if I yeah. knew before. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, it's anything to know for translation. But thank you uh, very much. It was a nice uh, conversation. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And hopefully we will work together in future. And hopefully I can travel to Australia in future. But uh, for now, it's just uh, through Zoom meetings and other... <laughs> media uh, but it's still fun <laughs> thank you it is very still, much it's still fun and thank you very much natasha for all the work you do and the work in education which is and for your holistic approach which is fantastic because we just can't fix things just looking at one problem we have to look at the horse and the horse and rider as a whole which is a complex thing and we it it makes us work harder so thanks for trying and for really going there which is a big challenge <laughs>